The following interview was conducted with Professor Howard Salkin for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, September 12, 2008, at his residence in West Lafayette. Good afternoon and welcome. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. And Good tell afternoon. us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and early years. Uh, I was born in 1934 uh, in New York City. Um, my parents, uh, Sam and Clara Zalkin, um, had me, I think, rather uh, late in life. My mother was probably in her 40s, my father in, in his late 50s, and they had um, come from Russia. Um, oh, maybe maybe 10, 10 years uh, or 15 years uh, previous, and they both had uh, large families, a number of uh, brothers and sisters. And they were all in uh, New York, in this area of New York. And there were there were a lot of uh, Russians there at the time. And I, re I remember my grandmother and my grandfather, and then all uh, my aunts and uncles would come over, and it would be uh, a, a very lively. There would be very lively uh, times uh, there. This was um, in New York, in the Bronx, and we lived in uh, an apartment building. Um, in the Bronx. I don't remember a whole lot. I, st I started um, elementary school uh, there, um, went through maybe grade three or so, grade three or grade four. And um, it was a happy time because of, of the family. Um, but I don't, I don't have a lot of specific uh, recollections. Where'd you go to high school? Were also there as well in the Bronx? No. Oh. I, uh, um, when I was about nine or ten, we moved to Los Angeles. That was 1940, oh, nine, 1941 or 42. The war had just started. We moved to Los Angeles because one of my aunts and uncle had um, moved there. Um, they thought it would be um, good for us, and so I went to um, I elementary school, junior high school, and high school in uh, in Los Angeles, and also a college, started college. Uh, Tell there. us a little bit about high school, how large it was, and were there any activities? Oh, high, high school was um, uh, sort of interesting. Um, it was um, we lived we lived in Hollywood, and so I went to Hollywood High School. But um, I didn't recognize that it was any different from any other school. It was it was a regular it was a regular school, and only later people uh, asked about it, and I, I I began to read that oh there were there were entertainers uh, kids who uh, who went there, but but I didn't really have any um, any, any knowledge or interaction with. Um, those people, I, I was into sports a lot, and what particular any particular sport that you? I, I played basketball for for a while. I, I wasn't good, but I I enjoyed it, and um, uh, high school high school was a good time. Uh -huh. Did you um, uh, back and forth? You just walked. Was school close to where you lived, or did you have to take a bus? Was there a distance? I had, I wasn't able to walk. I had to take a city bus. Mm -hmm. We when I was growing up, we never had a car, and so well, I, in New York you could you wouldn't really you could get by without a car. <laughs> Use the subway. Yeah, yes, but even even in even in in Los Angeles, uh, even then most people had cars. Uh, the public transportation wasn't so great, but we went everywhere uh, by bus, mm -hmm. and it was no problem. Sure, the service was good. It was okay, and, yeah. Right. Sure, okay. Uh, then t tell us when you when did, what year did you graduate from high school, and then did you go on to college? Let's see. I must have graduated from high school around forty around forty nine, nineteen forty nine, okay. or so. Mm -hmm. And I went, uh, I started at UCLA. I went to UCLA and I majored 
in, I started majoring in engineering. Any particular, man, mechanical or electrical? Well, or just it was general? only the first year, and I didn't have to, I didn't have to uh, specify. Um, during the first year, I saw that engineering really wasn't for me. I didn't, I didn't like all of the math and physics, and it, it was tough. Uh, probably at the end of the first year, the beginning of the second year, I decided I would change my major. And at UCLA, they had a, a lot of, they had very good career counseling. So I, I went to the counseling center to determine, to try to help me decide what I should, what I should major in and where to point myself for a career. And um, the indication was that I would probably, I would probably enjoy uh, the life sciences rather than um, than engineering. And so, for the next, for my second year, I was undeclared um, for a major, and I just took courses. I enjoyed uh, microbiology very much, um, and so I th it looked like the life sciences would probably um, be be suitable uh, for me. Well, there was there was nobody in my family. My mother and father really couldn't advise me about um, career choices and education. They only wanted me to get an education. Well, that's uh, that's good. That's nice. Uh, um, yes. Well, that was that was important. Right. I would fool around with them and say, "Oh, I would just be a mailman or a garbage collector," and um, they made sure that that didn't happen. <laughs> good for them. Good for them. Were you living at during uh, at UCLA? Did you live on campus? Oh no, no. Oh. Oh, we we lived. Uh, we 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 had an apartment in in Hollywood. Uh, always lived in an apartment my my whole time growing up mm -hmm. in fact until coming to um to, to Lafayette it was always in an apartment and a rather small modest apartment mm -hmm. and so I would take the bus um to um to UCLA mm -hmm. um but I had a I had an uncle it was Uncle Bill and he was um he was he was college educated, and he tried to uh, he tried to help me, and somehow we decided that living in California, and having it was necessary, of course, um, to, to to get a job when you when you finish school. Living living in California, the food industry and agriculture was so important that something related to that would uh, would be good uh, to study. And based on the courses um, that I liked, he suggested that I ought really try uh, food, food science. Well, that sounded okay. We looked we looked at the um, at the courses and all and um, there was a there was a lot of um, um, biology and some chemistry and um, things that I liked. And after after my second year at UCLA, being an, having an undeclared major, um, I decided I would major in uh, in food science. And to do that, I had to uh, transfer to the University of California at Davis. Davis is is um, in Northern California, uh, um, not too far from Sacramento. And it's a, it's an agricultural college, and now looking back, I would say that Davis and Purdue are very similar. If you took the if you took the engineering school away from Purdue, and and if the ag school at Purdue were to um, be the the dominant entity, they they are very similar places. Right, and they have the vet school there too. 
They had a vet school there, yes, yes. I visited that campus one time when I was at a meeting, and we, they had a tour and went up there, so I, it's a nice campus. This it, was, yeah. it was small right. at, at, at that time. Now it's grown a lot, but at that time it was small, but it was very nice, and I, I loved it there. And I, I took food science classes and got my degree in food science. It was probably 1952 or so. Okay. Then you had that, you lived on campus then when you were... Then I lived on campus. Sure. Okay. I okay. lived in a dorm. Right. Okay. Um, were there many students in the food science uh, department there at that time? Was the enrollment? It department? was, it was a, a fairly uh, large department, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how many students, mm -hmm. but it, it was fairly large. And it was it was very interesting, and so after my third year, that was to be after the first year at Davis, um, in the summer, I got a job back home in Los Angeles, working at uh, Hunt Foods, uh, at, at at the cannery, uh, in in quality control, and it was okay, nothing nothing great, but. It, I, I got an introduction uh, to the food industry. Good point. Uh, uh, and then I went back for my last year. I finished uh, on time and um, got my degree and came back to Los Angeles and got a job at a, at a brewery, Rheingold Brewing Company. And I worked at Rheingold Brewing Company for one year. At the end of the year, they they were bought. They they essentially went out of business, and they were bought by another brewery. And uh, everybody, most of the people there, uh, lost their job. And so at that time, I decided, well, food science is okay, but maybe I should go to graduate school and have more interesting. Uh, career opportunities. Knowing many of the of the faculty now at Davis, it was easy um, to write uh, to them and to uh, to make an arrangement to come back for graduate school. I originally I originally went back to the food science department because I, I knew so I knew so many faculty there. And I started uh, a master's degree in food science without, without the thought of really working in food science. And I took mostly, mostly um, biology and chemistry uh, classes. Um, and at that time, there was no biochemistry at Davis, but just then, a group of people from Berkeley um, came to Davis to establish a biochemistry department. There were four faculty who came. Paul Stumpf, Eric Kahn, Lloyd Ingram, and forgot his first name, Chaikin. And these four people established a biochemistry department. As soon as they landed at Davis, I enrolled myself in biochemistry. And they were terrific. These four people were terrific. There were only a small number of biochemistry students um, at that time, maybe 10 or 12 or so, um, who had previously been at, been at Davis doing, doing other things. Oh, agricultural chemistry. That that was the that was the name of the of the program that I was in in food science. There were only a small number of people who went into biochemistry, and these four these four professors did everything. They handled. They did all the lectures, all the courses, and they were terrific. They, they were just they put it all together, and um, they. They they um, they taught us, and in a in a very in a, in a very intimate and personable way, 
and spent a lot of time with us. Um, and so that, that, really, that really influenced me a lot. A lot of mentoring How, and in, made an impact on you. It made a big impact, right. um, especially Paul Stumpf. Paul Stumpf was a very well-respected plant biochemist uh, who had previously been at Berkeley. He, he knew, he, he must have been about 50 years old at the time. He knew people all over the country and was, was widely known. And um, he, he invited um, many prominent biochemists to visit, come give seminars. And whenever somebody came, he always had the students, got the students together, brought them into his office with um, the visitor, and we sat down together as a group, all of us, and had a terrific conversation with whoever the speaker was. And it it's was great. It's very nice. Uh, very helpful too for the students. It, it was a, it was a, and so I, I felt I got a terrific education uh, from those uh, those four uh, people. Were there both undergraduates and graduate students? At that time, at that time, they they were, we were all graduate students. But then, then subsequently, the undergraduate uh, program started. Okay. I l was about ready to leave, and I maybe had already left. And they n they now have a large undergraduate uh, program. Mm -hmm. Eric Kahn was a very a very good. Uh, teacher, and he he did a lot of the of the undergraduate uh, teaching, um, along with newer people who came afterwards, sure. um, um, in in the, in the undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. Now, when you finished, what was the next step? Oh, it was it was interesting. Uh, pa Paul Stumpf took an interest in everybody, and he made sure that everybody who who finished had something good to do. And he, he wanted to know what I'd like to do so that he could, uh, so that he could help me. Great. Um, in my last year um, in, in biochemistry, uh, uh, partly because of him, uh, of his teaching, and partly from uh, a few graduate student seminars that I I had to give. Um, I became interested in a particular field. It's called um, oxidophosphorylation, bioenergetics, how the cell generates uh, energy. And so I told him I was interested in that. And he said, well, oh, it's clear the best person in the country working in that area is F. Racker, Ephraim Racker, and he's in New York. So he took me into his office and he called a racker on the phone and told him that there's a student who's interested um, in doing a postdoc with him. And he, um, he, he, he arranged for it to happen. Um, Racker's lab was too um, popular to, to, go, to get into right away and so I had to wait um, uh, a year before before going there. And um, one of the other people in the department, the younger, the, the, the youngest member, Chaikin, gee, I can't think of his first name. Uh, <laughs> you got the last name. It'll come when you see the transcript. That's okay. Yeah. Um, Chaikin um, had done a postdoc at Harvard with um, a, um, a biochemist named Conrad Block, who was a very well-known uh, lipid biochemist and had a large group. And in that group, there were several senior people who also had their own students. And one of these senior people was John Law. 
John Law had his own his own program, but he worked as in in Conrad Bloch's laboratory. He was part of Bloch's uh, large research group. And oh, Sterling Jacob, that's his name. Uh, Sterling thought that John Law would be a very good person for me to uh, to work with. Uh, he was young and energetic and very bright, uh, um, and he would he would look after me, um, and I, I would learn a lot, and then I could um, I could go uh, go on to uh, to F. Racker's lab the following year, and so that's what I did. I went to Harvard, and went to John Law's lab, and had a wonderful time um, there. Before before going on to New York, sure. it's a bit of a change from the. You, had you been to the Boston area before? No, I had oh. never. I had never uh, been uh, to Boston. I knew what not, what New York was like from visiting, but I I had a crazy idea when I was in California. I didn't. I I I loved. I liked. I liked California very much, but I didn't really appreciate how special it was, and and I thought. I could live anywhere. What's the difference? We'll just go to the best places and uh, study and then work in the best place. It didn't really matter where you live. That, that was my attitude then. I don't think that way now. <laughs> it's okay. It changes over time. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> so I, I had never been to Boston. Boston, I, 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 I lived in Cambridge within walking distance of, uh, of Harvard. It was a tough place to live. It was really something special, and I didn't. I didn't have the city smarts. You know, if you parked your car somewhere and didn't move it, or you left it too long in front of somebody else's house, they would they would call and have your car towed away. I mean, it was it was really something. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, there are streets in Cambridge and all of the other surrounding towns that have the same name and they're not the same street but they have the same name and I mean it was it was it was it was a terrible place um, to live but a wonderful place to study um, uh, Harvard Harvard was great the lab was great uh, the people there were um, uh, stimulating and it was a very good educational experience good good and you got there were some cultural opportunities there too, which was nice. The, the cultural yeah. opportunities sure. uh, were good, and but I worked all the time. Yeah, I bet, <laughs> right, exactly. So then, then did you, the next year, did you go to New York? Then, then I went to New York. Okay. Um, and I went to Racker's lab. I lived in Forest Hills, and took the um, the subway into uh, to Manhattan. Racker's lab was interesting. It was. At a place called Public Health Research Institute of New York City, um, and this this was a research institute that was connected with the health department. the The health department, New York City, supported it, and the health department um, was connected to it. And it there was a lot of there was some research directed to health-related issues um, in New York. But there were, in addition to that, there were several laboratories with um, well-respected, nationally prominent uh, scientists who were doing their own work. Racker liked this place. He had previously been at NYU the, the the public health research institute was in lower lower manhattan by the east river it was like the foot of the foot of east 14th street right by the river and it was it was a vacated desolate area there was nothing there besides besides this Health, this research institute, the warehouses and vacant parking lots. 
not too far from NYU. Previously, Racker had been at NYU. Um, he liked he liked the Public Health Research Institute because it was it was um, there was nothing there. It was not crowded. It was very easy to park there. There were no cars. There was nothing there. So he drove in from I don't know somewhere upper upper New York, and he was able. To, everybody was able to drive there and park. Um, um, because it was a, it was sort of an isolated place. I, I didn't like the place at, at all. It was it was how much around there? There was nothing around there. It was isolated. Um, um, the lab the lab was fine, and there were a lot of interesting people. I made a number of friends, and um, the sci- the science was wonderful. But it was not a. It was coming from Harvard. Boy, what a letdown! <laughs> what a different scenario. <laughs> what a different scenario. But the parking is what uh, attracted everybody, and you could you could drive there in New York. And, I agree. And so I I drove there um, every day. Sure. All right. So you were then. What was next? You were there for a year and, and then longer. I was there for um, three years. I had a fellowship. Um, an NIH fellowship for uh, for three years, and when I finished, um, I interviewed at a few places for a faculty position. Um, Princeton, uh, Dartmouth, and I didn't I didn't feel ready. I didn't feel like I was ready to um, to go on and uh, and take a faculty position. I didn't want to work in industry. I had had enough of uh, the food industry, and I, I didn't want to do that. And so, um, F. Racker phoned somebody he knew at uh, Columbia. Uh, David Sprinson, who was at the, uh, the medical school, and um, talked to him uh, about me. And I went to visit um, Sprinson at, uh, at the medical school, and I liked, I liked what they were doing there, and so I decided to do another postdoc. I, I went, I went to, to um, the Columbia... I forget what it's called now. Columbia Physicians and Surgeons. College of Physicians and Surgeons, right? That's that's where that's where it was. On 168th Street. On 168th Street, and um, I had moved from Forest Hills into uh, Manhattan. I lived on fifth East, on West 15th Street, 15th Street, just off of Eighth Avenue. And I got on. I was able to get on. I think it was the A train, maybe. And go up to 168th Street in 10 minutes, and uh, it was it was pretty good. Right. Yes, it is. I agree. The only problem was, you know, I had a car, and it was diff- It was it was tough to know what to do with my car, but, but sort of a, a, an interesting the thing. The alternate happened. street parking. Yeah, all that. Jazz and and the car. no parking. It was awful, and you couldn't park. You couldn't. You wouldn't ever take your car to. Um, uh, P and S College of Physicians and Surgeons, but a friend of mine from um, Public Health Research Institute lived in Brooklyn in Brooklyn Heights, and where he lived, it was easy to park. And so I left my car at his house on the street in Brooklyn Heights, and um, I used the subway all the time to go up to uh, to P and S to uh, to David Sprinson's lab. Right. Good. That was nice. Yeah. Then what? Tell us what then what occurred after you finished there. Well, in in his lab, I learned a completely new area. In in F. Racker's lab, um, my my subject was um, oxidative phosphorylation. I worked in oxidative phosphorylation, um, and it was uh, I I did okay. Um, Racker was more than pleased. Um, there were there were some things that I didn't um, 
that, did, that didn't really appeal to me about it. One thing was he had, he had a big operation there, um, a lot of support uh, services. For example, um, somebody would go to a slaughterhouse every Monday and bring back something like four or five or six beef hearts and then process those beef hearts to isolate the particular um, organelle called mitochondria that are used to study oxidative phosphorylation. Well, that was a big operation to make mitochondria. He had a little factory there to do that. Um, and there were other support um, uh, uh, services that, that he had that were set up there to, to assist everybody. Well, I wanted to be able to work on something that I could do more by, my, by myself. So in Sprinson's lab, in David Sprinson's lab, uh, I learned an area that involved uh, microbial regulation, the regulation of metabolism. And I learned um, working with uh, bacteria. At that time there it was Salmonella typhimurium. And uh, I worked on a pathway of biosynthesis and um, learned about uh, some of the enzymes and um, studied how these enzymes were controlled, how they were regulated to uh, orchestrate the, the, proper, um, uh, the proper amount of um, the synthesis. This was an emerging area. Reg regulation uh, of metabolism was then uh, an emerging interest in, in biochemistry. And so that's what I did for, for two years. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. And then I decided I, I, I needed to have, I wanted a, a, a permanent job. Um, Sprinson wasn't able to help me too much. And so um, I asked F. Racker. I, um, and of course, he, he was um, very pleased uh, to help me. And he was like Paul Stumpf. He knew people all over the country and he knew what was going on. He was very well connected. Um, he knew Barney Axelrod. Um, and he knew that Barney Axelrod had just become um, head of the Department of Biochemistry at Purdue and was looking for, uh, for people. And so he suggested that it would be good to, um, to, check, to check out um, uh, Barney Axelrod in Purdue. But he, he also uh, cautioned me, you better also, um, better also visit someplace else. And he, he, knew, he knew somebody at the University of Oklahoma at the, um, at the medical school. It was not at the, at, the, at the main campus. The medical school was in Oklahoma City. And so he arranged for me also to check out a job there. And so one week I went to Oklahoma City for a few days and um, spoke to the people there. I can't remember the names now of who, who those people were. Mm -hmm. And then a week or two later, I came to Purdue, and uh, and I met Barney. Well, once you meet Barney, um, <laughs> and and see Purdue, um, there were there was no choice. I I I, I had job offers from uh, from both places, but um, Purdue Purdue was clearly the uh, the place to come. And you came. And I came. Right. Did you have family at that time? Oh no, that that's very important. Okay. Could we stop now? Oh, yes, sure. Okay, so now you're at Purdue. Well, I'm at Purdue, but we have, to go, we have to go back just a bit. Sure, go ahead. To, uh, to New York, to, uh, oh. to P&S. Okay. To uh, um, David Sprinson's lab. Um, towards, in, in, after, after my first, about after my first year in um, 
Sprinson's lab at PNS. At PNS, um, I met a woman uh, in New York. Her name um, was Johanna Rose, and we started going out. And um, we really liked each other. And then um, towards uh, towards the time, getting close to the time that I knew I would be, I would have to leave and get a job. Um, we decided that we've got to make this permanent. We we. we We've got to get married, and so we we got we got married um, just about the time that I was leaving um, uh, Sprinson's lab, and Johanna actually came with me to visit Purdue to uh, to check it out and uh, to see how she liked how she liked it. Johanna had never lived outside of Brooklyn, and um, there was some apprehension about um, coming coming to uh, to a small town. You know, New Yorkers, many New Yorkers are very provincial. They think they can't live anywhere else. There's nowhere else in the world that uh, you can live. Uh, jo Johanna wasn't that way, but still, uh, her parents maybe uh, uh, might have been. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, but she, she came out with me and um, she visited here and there, were, there was a very fortunate thing that happened that um, influenced her in a positive way about um, West Lafayette and Purdue. Her parents had very good friends in New York, uh, Gus and Helen Wollen. And they were friends for many years in, in New York, and they had common political leanings, um, and they, they were very, very close friends. Well, Gus and Helen moved away, and they, they eventually wound up in West Lafayette. And so when we first, when we came here for the first time to visit, Johanna's parents said, we've got to, we've got to go see Helen and Gus. And we went to see them. And they lived right next door to Barney and Sarah on Hollywood uh, Street, Holloway. Is it Holloway Street? Yeah. I'm sorry. And they... They they weren't close friends, but of course they they knew they were each neighbors. other. They were neighbors, yeah. Right, sure. And um, the Wollens became good friends of ours, uh, actually. And to and to to come here knowing to somebody that was really important uh, for Johanna. Right. We both liked the Wollens very much um, when when we met them, and they liked us. Um, was and, he affiliated with the university? Yeah, he 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 was a math professor. So they came to, to here to be he, at Purdue. He, he, they came uh, to be to be at Purdue, and he taught he taught in math. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he got sick, prostate cancer, and he died uh, much too much too early, maybe in his sixties. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he was such a, a vigorous, active, athletic uh, man and. It was really a shame, but now we still see uh, Helen Wollen. Uh, um, she lives in University Place, and uh, she's terrific. She's in her nineties. So, so we we both met Barney, and we liked Barney. And Barney and Sarah took us into their home, and uh, we just had to come here. It, it was um, it, it was really meant to be. So we are at Purdue, right? Yes. In biochemistry. In biochemistry. Yeah. Tell us a little about that and also your research areas too, your teaching and et cetera, when you um, came. Oh, maybe I'll tell you one more thing okay. about Barney. Where did you live when you first came here? What was housing like? Um, 
Okay, I'll tell you that, and then we'll go oh, back sorry, to Barney. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we lived we lived in an apartment across Happy Hollow Road, right across from them, right on Happy Hollow Road, right at the bottom there, Knob Hill, Knob Hill Apartments. We lived there for uh, for two years, and then we started looking around for um, a house to buy. And um, after after two years, we bought a house on. Um, on on Wilshire Avenue in uh, West Lafayette, the Cumberland area, and and we lived there uh, until we came here. But there, there's one there's one other thing I wanted to tell you um, about Barney. He he hired at the time that we came, 1966. He hired, I believe. Six faculty members, six young faculty members, at the same time. There was um, Hank Weiner, Carl Brandt, Gunter Kohlhoff, um, Butler, 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 Larry Butler, um, and me, and Vic Rodwell had come just maybe six months before. So there were there were six new new faculty coming about the same time all at the same time and that really made an instant bonding six new people coming to the same place in a very hospitable environment um made um made a made a, a very strong bond um, between between us, right. and then within a year or two, um, um, we hired uh, several more uh, people, uh, um, and so this was really this was really the beginning of um, modern the modern biochemistry department uh, at Purdue. Previously, it was agricultural chemistry. I was going to ask you about that. I did see some names that there there used to be a department. By that name, I wasn't too sure about. The, the name on the building is Agricultural Chemistry, the um, Biochem Building. Yeah, hmm. um, and Forrest Quackenbush was the previous head, uh, and at that time, the head of Agricultural Chemistry was also the state chemist. Those two jobs were linked together. And Forrest, Forrest uh, had this um, position for a number of years. I don't, I don't know how many, and I don't know what happened. What was the uh, the impetus for um, establishing a department of biochemistry? However, that happened. People asked Barney uh, to be to be the head. He he had come to Purdue. Oh, several years earlier, maybe f three or four or five years earlier, um, and maybe I don't know how Earl Butts was the dean at the time. I don't know. I'm sure he was involved in this. I don't know how it happened, but Barney was asked to be the head, and he agreed to do it on the condition that the two jobs were split. And he did not have to be the state chemist. That was an administrative position with a lot of stuff that was um, unrelated to biochemistry. Important, but unrelated um, to, uh, to biochemistry. The state, the state chemist certifies all the agricultural products that are used uh, in Indiana. It's a very important uh, position and, and function. But, but Barney wanted to, to do biochemistry, not... Um, not the other. Not the other. And so they agreed to split it. And the first uh, dedicated state chemist was Elwin, Elwin, Elwin Shaw. Can't think of his last name. First name is Elwin. And, and, and that's very important, actually. The state chemist has a lot of money because... Um, the agricultural enterprises in the state 
that need his services to analyze um, products uh, pay for this. And so the state chemist has a lot of money. Um, I, don't, I don't know how Barney did this or what the, how the arrangement was made, but the arrangement was made that Barney would be able to use state chemist money in the establishment of the biochemistry department. And so he used that money through the, somehow through the courtesy of Elwin that allowed us to initially buy some of the equipment that was needed. So when we all came, we didn't have grants initially, and in the first year, Barney was able to put us in a lab and give us the basic necessary equipment that we would need to start a research program um, from money made available by Elwin. Elwin Shaw, Elwin. Um, now, Elwin had one other uh, great asset. He, he needed students to work for him to do the analytical procedures, to, to, to do the quality control, to analyze the agricultural products that came into the department, the fertilizers and the feeds, and the pesticides. Um, he, he, need, he needed manpower to do that. And um, he had some students. Uh, so, some, some students worked part-time um, doing that, and they also worked part-time in agricultural chemistry. Well, when we came, that, that policy continued, and some state chemist students, supported by the state chemist, that was important, he paid them, uh, they became graduate students in biochemistry. So we had some, some graduate students from the state chemist. We had a lot of financial support from the state chemist and also uh, an unusual amount of support, I believe, from, uh, from Earl Butts. Um, Earl, according to what Barney uh, said, um, Earl, Earl Butts spent a lot of time in Washington and he, he liked to operate on a, on a grander stage than, than Purdue. Although at Purdue, he, he did a, a terrific job and was well appreciated and respected by, by everyone. But he liked Washington, and he was away a fair amount. And so he, I think Barney uh, told me that he, he would supply um, quite, a, quite a lot of resources and let Barney do what he wanted. Uh, there was very little oversight. Barney didn't have to, didn't have to check with, uh, with Earl about uh, everything. So we had a, we had a great start. Good, good launch. Uh, a good launch. Right, okay. Now, there was one other, one other important thing uh, to to our start, I, I I told you, I told you about the state chemist. Well, agricultural chemistry was very important also. Um, agricultural chemistry um, may not have been in the forefront of what was happening. Um, in, in biochemistry, but it had it had a terrific graduate program. There there were there were a number of faculty in, in agricultural chemistry who then became faculty in, 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 in biochemistry, older older folks. And they they had graduate students. Now they, 
they had, they were able to recruit an unusually large number of graduate students. In part, because of funding from the state chemist, um, I, and I don't know where the other funding uh, came from, maybe maybe from the state, because there there weren't they, there weren't um, not many of those people had research grants, I don't believe, but they had a terrific graduate program. They had they had a a file for recruiting students from hundreds of small colleges and universities around the Midwest. Um, and there were just graduate students coming out of the out of the walls. They were all over the place, and they um, they wanted to work and they wanted to um, to study biochemistry. And so, in 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 starting out, you need to have you need to have the the facilities and the resources to do the work. But it's you need also to have graduate students. Of course, we had too many, too many uh, graduate students. Uh, um, we thought it was too many. Uh, now, <laughs> you can really appreciate um, how wonderful that was, uh, because it's difficult uh, in 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 normal places. It's difficult to. Um, uh, recruit graduate students to work on your projects. When we came, uh, it was it was a bonanza. It was a bonanza. You had to refuse uh, students, so it was it was it was the most perfect start you could imagine. Right, sounds it very good. As I said, for all of us, for 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 all the new all, all the new people, the students wanted to work with the new people. Um, the old people had a lot of students also. Um, 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 and um, it, it, it was it was um, it was perfect. I can't think now of how we supported them. Some of them were supported by the state chemist. The department had some funds. I don't I don't know where Barney got that money, um, but anyway, that that wasn't a problem. I started working. Um, in an area related to what I had done in Sprinson's lab, in um, pathways of biosynthesis and their regulation in in microorganisms, that that was that was the research area that I started, and in my first few months here, I I worked on research grants. I wrote I wrote research grant. And I got funded by the National Science Foundation at the end of my first year, and then I had I had money to pay uh, graduate students from from my grant, and uh, that was it. We were started. You're off and running. Off and running. Right. Okay. Uh, and teaching teaching was uh, was something also. Um, when the biochemistry department was established, we were really the first class. We started the first class of biochemistry um, graduate students. There was also an undergraduate program. I'm not clear, and, and that continued. I'm, I'm not so clear about that, but the graduate, we started really the graduate program. Do you recall what year that would be? That would be 1966. When you came. We came in 66. Okay. I came in August or July. I came in July. Everybody came at least during the summer. And in September, we had to start teaching. Now, the usual, the usual procedure is you come and your first year you have off and you become um, acquainted with everything and you get started in research, and then you start teaching your second year. Well, all of us, we started teaching in September when school started, and um, we. It was it was really only possible 
because everything everything was so perfect. All the students we had students, and we had a lab. We had labs to be put into with with the the uh, the facilities, the equipment. Um, and so, so it, it it was really it, it was possible to do it, and we we had so many meetings in the beginning, and we established the curriculum, and we started teaching, and um, all of us uh, were equal. We all taught um, about the same. We established a general course in biochemistry that met every day for the for the whole year, both semesters, and. It was a comprehensive course in biochemistry, and we taught sections of it according to our previous interests. And so I taught for a month about oxidative phosphorylation and bioenergetics, how cells generate energy from my previous work. I also taught some about um, um, enzyme regulation, which was related to my new work. Um, and everybody um, uh, did this. Everybody taught their specialty uh, in this um, comprehensive um, biochemistry course. You're out there, up and running. Up and running. Yeah. So that that was teaching for the first semester. The second semester, I believe, I had a graduate student seminar and a special topics class related to um, to uh, enzyme regulation. Um, I, I don't remember uh, the details about it, but we taught both semesters uh, right off. Okay, all right, good. Uh, um, so, and the um, how did support over time? How did uh, support go over time? You get oh, the support, support. The support was terrific. Um, firstly, um, all of us were very energetic and we were state of the art and so we had no trouble getting national uh, research grants we all we all got grants and there was there was research research support from that um, secondly um, I don't know how Barney did it but if there was ever a problem um, if, if there was a student who wanted to work with you and you didn't have the money, Barney, Barney could do it. Uh, Some people just have a knack. It seems to work, work through the system, uh, um, yeah. which is good. He, he had a very good relationship with Elwin Shaw. I'm not sure it was Shaw, but I'll call him Shaw. The state chemist. The state chemist. Right. And uh, the state chemist had a lot of money, and so I'm sure some of it came sure. from there. But we didn't we didn't worry we didn't worry about uh, about money. Let me um, ask you a question about the state chemist. It's always been housed here. It's always it's, been for it's the al- researchers. I mean, to, uh, that I think that's a good point to to raise that the state chemist has been housed here at Purdue. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And still is today. Yeah. Yes, there was there was some effort to move it to Indianapolis. But you know that's political, and I don't really know how that was dealt with. But the people at Purdue wouldn't let go. Is the salary uh, paid by the state? The salary is paid by the state okay. uh, for the state chemist, okay. and it's a big operation. Oh, yeah. It's it's. I've heard yes, uh, having known of, known of, of, it's a, of knowing it. And, it was on and I think it has always been very well managed by um, the the state chemist. And it was a big advantage to have uh, students uh, here, um, first agricultural chemistry students and biochemistry students uh, here, um, and other personnel from, uh, from the university who would be drawn in and contribute uh, to uh, the operation. All right. okay. Okay. It's, a, it's a real, it's complicated and they, they really have a lot to handle. Oh. Shipper being the state of agriculture. That's yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, let's talk about, uh, how about fundraising and advancement? That's changed over time, hasn't it? The yeah. Fundraising. That, that's something I know nothing about. Yeah, but I, um, but since since the uh, Hansen and, and Dr. Baring, Dr. Jeske, that whole picture has changed a lot. 
Yeah. I, uh, I, knew, I knew nothing about that. When I came, um, Fred Hubdy was, 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 was president. Right. And even though I didn't have any close or intimate contact with with Hovde. I came to admire him so much. Um, he, um, I think, I think he, I think he was terrific for Purdue. I, th I think the way he ran things, it was very low key and accommodating. I, and I, I I respected him uh, uh, so much. You know, and he was I, here for a long time. He was here for a long time. Right. I had an accountant um, whose name I can't remember, who did my taxes. And this man, I should know his name because I, I saw him so many times. This man worked in the student union. He was an accountant in, in, the, in the business office in the union. Um, one of the uh, one of the head accountants. So he would tell me stories about Hubdi. You know, Hubdi, the Hubdis lived on South Ninth Street at that time, and they had some. They did entertaining at their house. A lot of entertaining at their house. I think maybe they also did some at Purdue at, at the at the Union, and um, um, the the bills for all of this were paid by um, by Purdue for for the for Hubdi's uh, uh, entertaining expenses and other expenses, but. He, but um, my accountant told me that every month Mrs. Hubdy would come into the business office and she would pay their bill. Everything that Purdue had spent on their behalf, she would pay back. Uh, uh, every month she would, she would come in and do this. They, they were really down-to-earth people who... Um, um, there are pictures even in the debris walking walking along campus, you know, with the students and uh, Fred Hufty would be walking. I've seen some pictures. We have the Hufty papers as well oh, you in do. the archives and special collections. An yeah. Another very special thing about um, Hufty was the commencement uh, exercises. Um, Purdue's commencement is, uh, is, is wonderful anyway uh, because the president always speaks. But when Hovde did it, it was really special. You know, Hovde was a Rhodes Scholar, and so he was he was at Oxford, and <clears throat> he had this this uniform, this paraphernalia from Oxford. Boy, was he regal when he <laughs> stood up um, <clears throat> at, at commencement, and when he started out, he, he started out. With a lot of hocus pocus in Latin uh, from from Oxford, it was it was just wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get a chance to hear that, but I've seen pictures of him in his outfit. You know, um, he was dressed for the commencement. It, it was a very special commencement address. Before he launched in, you know, to the usual inspirational stuff, it, it had the Oxford tradition and in Latin, uh, very very special. You had to really admire, um, and he was a down-to-earth guy who who did this. It, it wasn't uh, it wasn't an heir. It was it, it was him. Uh, it was him, and it, it, I guess he felt it was his responsibility um, to do this. Part of part of going along. Let's talk a little bit about um, what post-retirement activities. What you've been doing? Anything to share with the researchers? I I, I retired. I retired at the last day of 99, after my birthday, December 31st, when I was 65. And um, even though I've, I've maintained an office at Purdue, mm -hmm. um, 
I, I don't really use uh, my office. I have all my stuff there. Um, I don't I don't use my office, and I don't have a lot of contact with the biochemistry uh, department now, uh, except for some of the social events. Um, I like to get together with uh, the department for uh, for special special occasions, which I do. There, there, there's one there's one thing. Could we go back and I'll tell you one thing? One very nice thing that we did when Barney was nearing retirement, before retirement, not not before he retired from the department, but before he retired as department head. One of one of the nice things that we did is we established a Barney Axelrod lectureship. And this was established with money from his friends and family and from his colleagues at Purdue and around the country. And I gather it's a substantial sum of money. We use this money, we use some of this money to invite prominent people uh, to the department, back, back to Purdue, to Purdue, to the department, to give a lecture. Special people, not, uh, not ordinary people, special, specially uh, prominent people. And it used to be once a year this would happen. Now, it's maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, I'm not sure. And together with the lecture, there's always a, um, a large dinner for everybody in the department and some other interested um, faculty uh, at Purdue. And um, this, this has endured over the years. Well, in the beginning, um, I, I, I was responsible. One of my committee assignments was in um, choosing and inviting uh, people. And so I did this for about um, six or seven years and invited really a, a large number of really neat people. Um, the first one was Seymour Benzer. And there, there's an interesting story about Seymour Benzer. Seymour Benzer um, was at Caltech when we invited him. Um, I'm not sure whether he got a Nobel Prize or not. Maybe so. But he used to be at Purdue. Seymour Benzer used to be in biology at Purdue. And he was very important to Purdue. Seymour Benzer got his degree from Purdue in physics. And then he became interested in biology and got a faculty position in biology at Purdue. He was very instrumental in establishing biology at Purdue. The first important head of biology was Henry Koffler. Henry Koffler built the Department of Biological Sciences. And the way he initially did this was using Seymour Benzer. Seymour Benzer had already acquired a national reputation. And so having Seymour Benzer in biology allowed Henry Koffler to recruit outstanding faculty in biology. And, and um, Koffler built biological sciences into a really one of the top departments in the country at the time. Well, Seymour and Barney were very close friends. Um, they lived close to one another. I'm not sure where, where Seymour lived, 
but he and his wife and family, Dottie was his wife, he, uh, Seymour and Dottie and Barney and Sarah were, were close friends. Also, Seymour taught a class in, in biology in his specialty in, uh, in phage genetics that became very famous based on, on Seymour's work. And many people, some people at Purdue faculty uh, took that course. Barney, Barney took it, uh, other people. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a neat story about Seymour Benzer. Um, Seymour became very, very prominent and it became difficult for Purdue to keep him. And so Seymour actually left. He left Purdue, went to Harvard and was at Harvard for a couple of years. But um, Seymour had a family doctor, Ben Clatch, uh, here in Lafayette. And Seymour missed Ben Clatch so much that, uh, this is according to Barney, uh, Miss Ben clacked so much that he couldn't stay away, and he came back to Purdue uh, as a, as a faculty member, and and uh, stayed at Purdue a number a number of years more until finally leaving uh, for Caltech. Um, at at Caltech, uh, Seymour continued working. Oh, I know when Seymour left here, uh, his wife Dottie unfortunately died prematurely of cancer. And it was a very, very sad time for Seymour and his, I guess, grown kids. And maybe that was the time when they left. Um, I'm not, I don't think he was, I don't think Seymour was here in 66. How could that be? No, I'm not sure, maybe he was here. But I, I didn't know him. Um, Seymour left, went to Caltech, and was very, very prominent. Maybe won a Nobel Prize, I'm not sure. So I invited Seymour to be the first Axelrod lecturer. And he was delighted to come. It's tough to get, uh, get prominent people to take time out uh, to come. But this was easy. Uh, he came. Um, and I remember the thing that he said at his lecture, one of the things, how, how he started out. He said it was, he was so grateful to be able to come and do this while Barney was alive. So often he's asked to give this sort of lectureship and it's in memory of the named lecturer. And here he's doing it um, with Barney in the audience, and, and he was so pleased to be able to do it. Well, nice. Ben Ben Clatch was in the audience too, uh, which which was um, interesting. The other thing is, Seymour had a favorite restaurant in um, West Lafayette. It was the Peking. Do you know the Peking? It was it was on right at Northwestern there in, in the, the village. In, in the village. Um, these are people who came, who came to Purdue, Chinese people who came to Purdue from Boston when their sons came to engineering school. And opened the restaurant. And opened the restaurant. Right, yes. And that was Seymour's favorite restaurant. And so Seymour had to eat at the Peking when he came back. Well, of course, the Peking wasn't there anymore. But Harry, one of the sons, was still here. And he had, he had opened another restaurant in Lafayette. Over on 26. On 26. Right. And so we went there um, That's nice. for, for, <laughs> for, the, for, the, um, um, for the banquet uh, that we had uh, for the department. And of course, um, uh, Harry was so happy to see uh, Seymour. Uh, and, it, and it was a pretty nice, it was a nice time. Um, um, and, then, and then afterwards, all, all a, a lot of the folks uh, came over uh, to my house. Uh, it was interesting when, when Seymour came to my house. Um, Johanna has always had a cat. And as soon as Seymour came into the house, uh, he sensed something. And after a few minutes, 
he put on a surgical mask. And I guess he saw, he saw Johanna's cat. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's allergic to, uh, to cats. And so he spent the whole evening uh, behind his, um, his surgical mask. Um, and so that was the first. That was the first Axelrod uh, lecturer. Um, and then after that, we we had a number a number of others. And I I invited people like Phil Sharp was another one. Phil Sharp is here was here this week. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Well, I invited him um, to Purdue before he was a Nobel Nobel Prize winner, and he was an Axelrod lecturer. And we had. Um, um, Tom Check, another Nobel Prize winner. Stan Prusner, a Nobel Prize winner. We had a lot of really terrific people come as Axelrod lecturers. And then we had dinners, often, often at my house. Um, the first dinners that we had were catered by Jane. You, you know Jane. Jane owns that, that restaurant now. She started out by catering um, dinners for um, people at Purdue and also for events at Purdue. Um, and so, and, and she was she was really good because she liked to do ethnic um, cooking and you could tell her what what country, what, what type of food, and she would do the rest. Yeah, and, she's a very nice, I, she's done a couple things for me. I've used her. Oh, you really, use her? Does I she still do that? Oh, yeah. Does I, well, she, she the, does catering. She does catering? Well, she still does, and st of course has the restaurant, but she does catering. So she, she, catered, she catered these dinners uh, at my house, at our house, um, for uh, the first several years, and they, they were terrific. Yeah, right. Uh, so that, that was... That, that was um, uh, an, a very nice thing that we did for Barney and th that also um, for, for the department. It's sort of an uh, enhancement at Purdue um, and it, it was, it, it's continued. Right. And those are nice things to do, but I think I like that comment where the speaker said, I'm glad to come. It's in honor of him, but the person is still alive. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> right. and they were such close friends. Sure, That's a, which made it even better. The, 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 sure. And and I enjoyed so much that Ben Clatch was uh, uh, there in the audience um, uh, when after I had heard the story that that Seymour came back to Purdue because he missed he missed having uh, Ben Clatch as his internist. <laughs> yeah. uh, one final thing: uh, Do you want to have an outstanding event, and then any closing comments you'd like to share? Do you have an outstanding event? Or something else you'd like to share with us? Um, well, of course, the, the outstanding event in my life is personal. It's uh, marrying Johanna Good. and uh, bringing her here, and um, we've had a we've had a terrific time. And even though she's never lived outside of Brooklyn, she's come to love um, <laughs> Lafayette also. Rose on you. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, uh, science, science, professionally. One thing that was really neat um, in what year was it? It was in um, '95. Um, I was awarded an honorary degree at the University of Turku in Finland, and so going going there for that was uh, really special. Was, was very special. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I had never won, worn a tuxedo before that time. Well, the first day there, they took me to a shop, uh, a formal dresswear shop, and I got fitted for a tuxedo. Um, there's a picture in that, is that little book, and I have, I have a picture. And um, it was an ex a very formal occasion. Um, the president of Finland uh, was there. Uh, I remember at the, at the hotel Johanna and I stayed in, we were in the lobby one afternoon and all of a sudden a limousine pulls up in front of the hotel. Two people get out and start rolling out a red carpet from the street all the way into the hotel to the, to the desk and walking on the red carpet is the president of Finland. Uh, 
Special. Oh, super. So it, it, it was a it was a very, you know, there, there were a lot of a lot of these sorts of things, but this was very very formal and traditional, which made it um, extremely interesting uh, um, for me. So that that was an outstanding event. Oh, that's good. Any uh, summary or closing comments you'd like to to say for the researchers or your, on behalf of yourself? Anything special that you want to close with or? You think you covered it very well, many of the things that you've been involved oh. with. Well, yeah, okay. There is there is uh, one thing to say. Um, Purdue is a special place. Um, it may not be the number one university in the country. It's a very very fine university, but there's something very special about Purdue. Um, I've I've been to to other I've I've been to other universities. I I was at Harvard, and I've I've spent two years at Stanford and sabbaticals. Um, Purdue has a collegiality amongst the faculty and the staff that you don't find at other places. It's it's very uh, special. The spirit of cooperation uh, um, and support that um, you 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 get you get and give um, at Purdue is like none other I've I've ever encountered. So it's it's a special place. All right. Good. I think this. I really want to thank you very much for this interview. It's a great opportunity, and thank you. Oh, thank you.